How many remember Volcom? In the early to mid 2000s, Volcom was a major player in the world of action sports. And although some might stop short at calling it streetwear, I would argue that they were a part of a group of brands that created the genre in the early days. But over the years, they've fallen from grace of days past. And why is that? Well, let's find out. I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com, and this is the rise and fall of Volcom. But before we get started, don't forget to smash that like button. It's free for you and it helps the YouTube algorithms notice and suggest us to more people. But with that being said, let's get to it. It all started way back in 1991 when two friends, Richard Woolcott and Tucker Hall, decided to take a trip to Lake Tahoe to ski. Tucker had recently lost his job, but he still wanted to make the annual trip so that he can get his mind off of his present problems. But little did the friends know, this trip would wind up changing their lives. They had so much fun that Richard called in to work and lied about being snowed in at Tahoe just so they could keep riding. Both Richard and Tucker were avid fans of action sports like surfing, skateboarding, and snowboarding and found themselves having so much fun in Lake Tahoe that at the end of the trip, Woolcott ended up quitting his job so that he could spend more time snowboarding. Though he and Hall had discussed starting an apparel company while on the trip, it wasn't until later that spring that they decided to start making t-shirts with the help of a $5,000 investment from Woolcott's dad. And at first, the shirts were really just sold as a way to fund the friend's newfound love of snowboarding, with both taking every opportunity they could to go off adventuring and find new places to ride. Not having a background in administration, nor being actual businessmen, the first year's sales reached only $2,600 in profit. The direction that they were traveling in was unsustainable, and as funds began to run dry, the senior Woolcott decided to step in to make sure his investment wasn't going to waste. He rose the alarm that if they didn't get their acts together, they would be out of money and business in less than three months. Realizing that if they really wanted to do this thing, they had to get it together, the friends began to get more serious, and in return, their financial picture began to improve. In 1993, Balcom released a film called Alive We Ride. The company's first video production featured footage from surfers, skaters, and snowboarders from around the world and a new unit, Vico Productions, was formed. In 1995, Volcom was the first clothing company to have its own record label, Volcom Entertainment. They developed a great relationship with the Vans Warped Tour, and soon, the Volcom stage joined the tour. In 1997, major boardwear retailer PacSun began selling Volcom t-shirts at a few of their stores. They sold well, and several months later, PacSun added the company's shorts and began to stock Volcom clothing at all of their locations. Which has come to be known as a bad thing is, PacSun today is a place where streetwear goes to die. But back then, that wasn't quite the case yet, and PacSun had the ability to bring products to a wider range of customers. Volcom's staff came largely from the board sports community, and its distribution facility had a half-pipe skateboard ramp out back. Promotional efforts were just as unconventional. They used tactics like sending a battered sailboat emblazoned with the Volcom logo up and down the beach during the surf competition, or having a large Volcom-sponsored recreational vehicle, quote, break down in traffic in front of the U.S. Open of Surfing after which staffers would jump out and hand out Volcom gear until the cops showed up. In 1999, Volcom's surging sales made it necessary to move from the 10,000 square foot space that they had been sharing with several other businesses into an 86,000 square foot site that had most recently been home to Woolcott's former employer, Quicksilver. The new location would serve as a combined headquarters slash distribution facility, 
As most of the company's clothing was manufactured in such countries like China or India, and only t-shirt screen printing was done in the U.S. The year 2002 saw Volcom open a retail outlet in Los Angeles, which would carry clothing, music, videos, and limited edition items, including box set jeans and t-shirts. Realizing the damage that oversaturation could do, as the company grew, its management took pains to ensure that its clothing never really reached mass marketers, which could cause it to lose its status as an elite brand. Volcom's clothing were seen by boarders as, quote, core or part of the hardcore boarding lifestyle. But if they started to be seen on wannabe surfers, the party would be over. Staying true to the fans seemed to be big for Richard and the team, but at that same time, they needed to grow. After reaching a certain point in their life cycle, many companies like Volcom sold out to larger firms such as Nike or Quicksilver to help fund expansion. But rather than following this path, Wolcott decided to go public in 2005. The money raised would go to pay 20 million owed to existing shareholders improve infrastructure, marketing, and advertisement, and start to bring the company's foreign sales under its own control. The transition ultimately went well. Volcom continued to expand and be picked up by tons of new fans worldwide. Fun fact, Volcom was actually one of my first introductions to skate slash surf culture and fashion. In the early 2000s, I was a huge fan of Lil Wayne and Lupe Fiasco, and skate culture had invaded rap, and like many others, I began to take a liking to the sport and the style that accompanied it. I came across Volcom at PacSun and was a fan of the t-shirt designs and subsequently jumped on board, no pun intended. But after two decades in business, Richard Woolcott and crew had reached the top of the pyramid. His partner Tucker had retired and retained a portion of stock in the company, and Woolley began to look to cash in on his years of hard work. In May of 2011, French clothing giant Keurig offered to buy Volcom for $24.50 a share, so Woolcott decided to take him up on the offer. The deal took Volcom to new levels from a reach standpoint, but on the downside, one of Woolcott's biggest fears for the brand will become a reality. Old school fans of the brand were becoming disenchanted. They felt that Volcom had come to represent the very worst of what had happened to surf and skate over the years. The dream was sold. Great for those who cashed out on the IPO, but not for the label left behind to groan under the weight of unachievable growth. The new owners had no connection to the culture, nor did they care. Much like my story on Crew, the new owners were in it simply for money. But also like Crew, Volcom didn't completely die. Their site is still up and they still do regular releases, but the passion that the brand once had is no longer there. Whatever you may think about Volcom today, the legacy is undeniable. They started out in the bedrooms of two friends who decided to risk it all and go after a dream. They had an idea to launch a brand, they went after it, and they created a world-renowned clothing line, proving that if you have a dream and you go for it, you just may be able to achieve way more than you think you can. But what do you think? Were you a fan of Volcom? When was the last time you saw anyone wearing it? Hit us up in the comment section and let us know. Also, if you made it this far, then I have to assume that you liked the video. And if so, don't forget to hit that like button for me. As I always say, liking and sharing the video is the best way to help us to continue to grow as a channel. And if you want to be updated every time we drop a new episode, then hit the subscribe button and then the notification bell. This way you will be dinged when a new video drops. But with that being said, I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com signing out until next time. Peace.